Can't buy that spirit at Walmart. Can't find that peace at Harris Teeter. Can't find that preciousness, that nourishment. Can't find that at the mall. That's why we're here and not there. That's why we come on Wednesday and we don't go somewhere else. We don't do our grocery shopping on Wednesday because we can't get there. What we need here. If you got to make the choice between your flesh and your spirit, always choose your spirit. Because the way your spirit is filled, that literally changes your life. It changes your week, and it changes the days that follow. How many does the um, enemy tell you you're too tired to come on Wednesday nights? Like, I, I've never actually come to church on a Wednesday night. The devil didn't tell me I was too tired. And he also gave me all the emotions and the tiredness. Okay? Like, I've never been to church on a Wednesday night without feeling like I was too tired to come. I'm just being human. I, I never pay that any attention. Because if I did, if I gave in there, I'd lose discipline everywhere else. It's just discipline. It's a discipline of the spirit. I don't feel like coming because I'm tired. But there's not one time that when I hit my foot, didn't hear the first note that my whole mind was changed about everything. Even on Sunday mornings, until I walk in this house. That's not what my best thought for the day is because I'm always more tired on Sunday morning than any other morning. We know who does that. On Monday, when I could actually sleep a little longer, no, I'm hopped up. I'm hopped up. Yeah, what's that? You don't need no high spiritual level of understanding to know exactly what that is. So I just want to talk to you a few minutes this morning on something that um, if you're not really a spiritual Christian, it's not very interesting. So you, you may tune out. But those of us that have walked, my God, through the dark of the night, who've walked through the deepest trials, let me talk to you a few minutes. Because this one word, faith, that word is both boring and exhaustive in its meaning. Like, it, the deeper you move into spirituality, the more mystery the word has. The least amount of interest you have, the less spiritual that you, that's, that's your level of spiritual right there, spirituality. Because I'll tell you this, faith has a million aspects. So let's just talk about this. When we believe God says this, and now... Many of you are facing circumstances in your life that look like Everest. And if you could get there, you'd climb that mountain, even if you, even if you died trying, because you're so fed up with it. But it's an invisible mountain. But it may as well be Everest, except it's invisible, which makes it even more impossible to our naked eyes, to our flesh. We have approached this mountain we have stomped around this mountain. We've tried to climb this mountain. We've done everything. What is required when your faith gets disappointed, when your hope gets disappointed? What is the requirement? Do we have to try to figure out means to make his word come to pass? Do we have to try to figure out how is this going to happen? No, all we're required to do is in the face of all odds, keep holding that word. And you know what? Sometimes the word's too precious to throw to the masses. You just got that word, and it's tight. You ain't saying a word, but you ain't falling to the enemy's devices. I use the word ain't when I'm really mad. When you have a word that God's given you, Everything in the world, all your hopes, all your dreams are wrapped up in that hand. And the enemy shows you a million times on a million different movie screens every day how that is not going to happen. 
all you have to do to irritate the fire of him is nothing more than hold on to your word. He just showed you another way. It's absolutely impossible. And you go, hmm, really? I got my word. Not going down. Not going down easy. Not going down. Then he sends you a horrible thing that is the opposite. You were expecting a miracle, but it's the opposite of a miracle. Whatever that's called. A trial. And you, you're laying there. You're trying to breathe. You're saying... Should I be mad at the Lord right now because I'm really mad at something? I don't know who all, but this, this anger is rage. So, you know, directly it's going to the devil, but right now you're concerned whether some of it's going to heaven too. And you should lay there trying to breathe and trying to keep your mouth shut. Any more? Anybody have some prayer meetings like that? Where, where the best thing you could do is just go, mm, 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 mm. And keep your lips zipped until you have enough strength from listening to the word of God. Like you're, you may be down, flat, disappointed in the Lord, angry as all get out, rage is going to everybody anywhere in the you know, 50 mile radius. And you're just trying to decide what am I going to do right now with what I got? Because this is the opposite of what the miracle was supposed to be. And you lay there and you breathe. Maybe you say a few things to God that you wouldn't have never said had you been blessed that day. <clears throat> you lay there long enough to repent again. But then you're smart enough to just turn on the word of God and let it start playing in your ear. And you're watching your lips. If you want to say something, say it to the Lord. Protected conversation to the Lord. Because he, he, he understands conversation. He gets mad himself. So there you are. Now you just are letting the word. You're still the best of your ability keeping your trap shut. Because you have this thing in your hand. And you know that words are currency. You've either, you've either paid the price with words of good and blessing or words of curse and most of us say blessing 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 curse blessing 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 curse right i bless them you're a you're a powerful person of god you're you're mighty and powerful say it's the loved one you're trying to get saved you know i come i say because all we're really supposed to say is what they are the problem is we focus on what they are not yet so uh, we have to constantly remind ourselves, okay, you're a mighty person of God. You're powerful in the spirit. The passion of your ancestors has doubled in your life. And you're just doing, that's, that's your hold on, right? But now you don't have no strength. You're mad. You're angry. So you just turn on the word of God and you lay there. Might take all day. Honestly. In fact, there were, there's one, a couple times in my life that I did my best not to speak to God, man, or human. And I listened to the Bible for the entire waking hours of my day for four days in a row. And the first day, I couldn't tell any difference. The second day, I couldn't tell any difference. When I'm telling you I listened to nothing, 10 hours of the Word of God didn't feel no different. Third day. I was starting to feel a little bit strength. On the third day, I could feel my spirit begin to arise. It wasn't beautiful and powerful, but it was rising. It was getting up off the ground. On the fourth day, I'm sitting at Highway 68 in Sandy Ridge. Same a word of God. Nothing powerful. Nothing I remember. Just it was still playing because I knew I was in trouble if I let my mouth go and as I sat there something from the depths of my heart and I just went shakata I will say I started speaking in tongues I don't know what one of those words were nor what one thing they said but God does and the devil doesn't and you know what I went from a flat dead 
four days of the word of God and keeping my trap shut. And all of a sudden, I'm preaching in tongues. That's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. And I still had my thing in my hand. And it had not left. And I hold it today. Let me tell you something. As quickly as that happened from just nothing, nothing, a little bit. My God, to being powerful and prophesying in words I don't even know what they mean. And yelling and going on. I went on and on and on. Speaking what the Spirit told me to say. And I'm telling you right now, it's the devil's will for you to just get angry and not do something about it. But the Word of God has every weapon that is listed it's all in the word of God. Head of salvation. Yeah, garment of praise. Everything you need if you just start playing that. Play, play, play. Keep your mouth shut unless you have finally get strength to say glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Just do it. Because let me tell you something. The way the enemy gets us in longevity is longevity. But I will tell you this. Some of us. I'm looking across a congregation that I know what you're holding on to because we've prayed about it together. And I'm going to tell you right now what you don't know is God has let you wait because over in glory, you now have a magnificent reward. Through faith, you have walked through trial. Through faith, you have held on when finances weren't never coming. And you kept saying and believing and doing everything right. Through faith, you've laid your hands on people and on the sick and on, on all kinds of situations and couldn't see what was going to happen. But that quick, all God's waiting for is that moment, whatever he's deigned it to be. And you kind of got the feeling like it's now. Remember this. The devil's word is tomorrow. God's word is today. If revival's always coming, it's never here. If we go out and become a laborer and preach on the corner, then guess what it is? It's revival because we bring revival to this earth. God gave this earth to man. And then he says, now you men, men and women, invite me to come. He gave it to men, and he said, now, you invite me to come, you tell me, you declare, you decree my glory upon the earth, you decree blessings upon your brother, on your enemy, on your brother, on your sister, on yourself, declare them on your family, decree, declare, then worship and praise. The earth belongs to man, he gave it. So why did they, that's why, if you understand that, you understand, wow, the people of God are incredibly important upon the earth. We have to pray, let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven, because we have to invite it to happen. We are, the, the way God is manifested upon this earth is through us. And I want to tell you this, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit good, get more. <laughs> the Holy Spirit within you is the thing that teaches you, guides you, Tells you what you should do in, search, in, in difficult situations. But when you pray enough that the Holy Spirit hovers around you, hovers over you, it's following in your shadow, that's when it changes the atmosphere. This part changes us. But when this part is full, and it starts coming and following and hovering and it's surrounding. And our very shadow walking into the room, people are going, oh, my God, what was that? This is what we must be, and that's why. We don't care if we just sing one song. 
And then the, we, we worship until the glory of God fills the house. Because this is how he wants his people to behave. He wants worship. He wants praise. He wants honor. Let's lift up the name of our God. He is so marvelous. All power, might, strength, authority is in his hands. No enemy is strong enough to do anything. He is in charge. He's also in charge of time. He can stretch it. He can stop it. He can push it. He can do anything he wants with time. We, time is our enemy. It's not his enemy. He can stop it and make it stop dead. The sun's not going down today and it's staying up and he can stretch it. That how many days are you said, Lord, this is my day off. I, I want it to last all day. And that day was just seemed like it lasts forever. God has the ability to stretch. People have had entire visions of going to hell and then heaven where they felt like they waited in places for five and six hours and waiting was where angels were taking them there and they said wait here and go they said it felt like we had been gone an entire day and when they looked at the clock they only been gone seven minutes god is powerful all we have to do is keep holding on to that thing that he told us to hold on to and don't let it go you don't care what the enemy says in fact it's my great joy for the enemy and a thousand a hundred thousand others to tell me my dream's not come true. I ain't got nothing better to do than to believe it's still coming true. Make my day. You want to irritate the enemy? Let a million people tell me it's not true. It's still true. That's all we have to do. We don't have to do nothing else. We just stand in the face of the enemy. Though, though the enemy, like, though we're surrounded by enemy on every side, we hold it on. We hold on to it and say, it's still true. That's how we make the enemy miserable. My God's still powerful. My God's going to do it. Ha, ha, ha. My God's great. It could be this second. It could be in an hour. It's still going to happen. That's all you have to do. You know what? We have the strength for that. If you don't listen to word, pray in tongues, pray, 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 pray in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in tongues. The Holy Spirit is the way we are delivering the Lord to the world. We deliver him through the Holy Spirit that he sent to us. Some people think it's, oh, just, you know, whatever. That's for when you get it. No, you better be full of it because you need, the church is not this building. The church is you. Wherever you are, that's the church. You pray for somebody right then and there. You don't. Somebody comes to you, smile. You know, I've got horrible, horrible pain. I'm sick. Don't say, "Well, we have church on Sunday." My God, you better be ready to say, "My God, let's pray for that right this minute." I got the preach this morning. Let me give it to Pastor because he's got it too. I want to read from First Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 18. Then. The Lord said unto him, Go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king of Assyria. Also, thou shalt anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shephat of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Watch this now. It shall be that whosoever escapes, everyone say escapes, the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whosoever escapes, everyone say escapes, the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all of whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard them? This message is for the one that wants to get away. My subject is inescapable. Some of you are looking for a way out right now. You can run, but you can't hide. 
Because God's going to give you a word that's going to backstop you. That you won't be able to get away from even if you try. Let's ask God's blessing. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for the power of your spirit right now. For the hand of God to move in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Savannah got a bright idea one time to get us an appointment over at an escape room. It was me, my wife, and Jonathan and her. We paid, like they said, good money to go into a room with advance notice that you were going to get locked in and the rules of the game is you have a set amount of time to get out. How many's ever been to an escape room or heard of it? Oh my goodness, we need one at the church. <laughs> we ought to create one called escape, an escape prayer room. <laughs> that you can't get out until you've touched God. That you're going to have to stay there until you've had a breakthrough. Until it's not about time, but it's about intensity. Come on, somebody. All right, so so, uh, this is for those who... I, I want you to notice that God, in his plan for Elijah, and we talked about this, some of this Wednesday night, but he had a three-step plan. I want you to anoint three different individuals. I want you to anoint a king over Syria. I want you to anoint the next king over Israel. And then I want you to anoint a prophet in your place. And then, uh, of course, God expects um, people to try to weasel out of God's will. Why be a weasel when you can be a worshiper? Why, why try to wiggle your way out of God's presence when you can be wiggling your way into God's presence? Come on, some people just, uh, they just want to get away, amen, from the presence. Not I. Is there anybody that would stay all day in this house if the glory of God would just move and move and move and move and move, and heal, and inspire, and deliver. And so I want to say, I remember a sermon being preached years ago at a camp meeting here in our state. I can't remember exactly who preached it, but I remember the title. And his title was, There's an Angel in Your Future, or Angels in Your Future. Well, that is true. But there are also the possibilities of, uh, of uh, demons in your future and obstacles and necessities and setbacks. But I want to say this. There is also a sure word of prophecy. If the word spoken by angels is steadfast and inescapable, can I tell you God has a prophetic word for you. Do you know that each and every one of you are specifically designed to fulfill a particular purpose? And God has destiny for every one of us. And God has decreed. He knew you while you were being formed in your mama's womb. And he had a plan. I know the plan that I have for you. Now sometimes we don't know the plan. But all I need to know is you know. All I need to know is you know the plans that you have for me. And God's plan will be executed and that prophetic will of God will backstop you if you, when circumstance tries to knock you out, when sickness tries to throw you down, when demons try to attack you this way and that. Hallelujah. Come on. There's an Elisha there. Notice they sift through the king of Syria. They get by the king of Israel. But whoever gets by that one and gets by this and passes by that, I've got a backstop. And it's the prophet. And with the prophet comes a word of prophecy. 
I want to tell somebody, God has backstopped you by His plan. Do you hear me? Somebody needs to celebrate the fact that God has a plan. That God has a will. So Hezael, notice they had different objectives. He said, I want you to anoint Hezael the king over Syria. And Hezael uh, is who I call the smother brother. How many remembers the smother's brothers? Well, this is the smother brother. 2 Kings chapter 8. Let me read this quickly. It'll set the stage for his uh, ministry, as it were. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come hither. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go and meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him. Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael, went, he's a general, he went out to meet him, took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camels, uh, burden, 40 camel loads us, and you, whoa, 40 camel loads, and came and stood before Elijah and said, thy son Benadad, the king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. That's kind of a strange dichotomy. You're going to get well, but you're going to die. And he goes on, okay? He goes back to the king. And the king says, What did the prophet say? And the prophets, and he says, The prophet said, You're going to recover. Verse 15, and it came to pass the next day that this same Hazael took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, spread it over Ben-Hadad's face so that he died. He is the smother brother. I want to speak to the smother spirit. There's a spirit that wants to smother your faith today. There's a spirit that wants to smother your praise, to muffle the sound of your voice. But in the name of Jesus, the smotherer is going to be smothered by the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. We release the spirit of prophecy. The plan that God has for my life is going to take the cloth off of somebody and give them a chance to breathe. Somebody is going to take a big, deep breath this morning and breathe in the presence of the Almighty God. The king that was appointed, uh, uh, Jehu, was appointed king over Israel. Everybody knows what Jehu's first objective was. It was to take out Jezze. So the first one, Hazael, was a king killer. And Jehu was a queen killer. There's a lot of animals in the Bible. Aaron and Aaron's calf, Daniel's lions, Balaam's donkeys, Jezebel's dogs. But I not want to talk about the first two. He says, Hazael's going to take this out, and whom he doesn't take out, Jehu's going to take out, and whom Jehu doesn't take out, Eli Wait a minute. I thought Elisha was a man of peace. I thought Elijah was chill. I mean, Elijah might have had the disposition to rough somebody up. But Elisha, I mean, he was just kind of, sup. <laughs> let me just say, just for, let me just, I want to talk about how, the, you see, that Hazael and Jehu were, were, were um, 
put in position to defeat the, the uninitiated, the outsider, the stranger to the presence of God. Ben-Hadad was a notorious enemy of the children of Israel. Uh, Jezebel was obviously a bad-spirited woman who cared nothing for the things of God, who was an outsider to God's presence. But here comes the prophet. He comes to deal with a different kind, of, a different breed of cat. He doesn't come to minister to the outsider or to the uninitiated. He's what I want to call the flesh killer. The other, the other hit men dealt with foreigners. This prophet deals with the enemy that lies within. Forty-two bears, or no, two bears released on 42 young men was released by Elisha, the killer prophet. Now, I know you're looking at me like, whoa, whoa. He's about to get serious on us here. Why release bears? Now, the, old, the King James says 42 children, but it really means young men. Why should Elisha release two bears on 42 young men? Because of where they were and because of who they were. These were people that were the recipients of generational blessings. They lived and were born and bred at Bethel. Bethel was the place where the school of the prophets was. These, in fact, young men could have been sons of the sons of the prophets. And when somebody who's been blessed with a heritage, God expects them to be a blessing and not a curse. And so when a curse emerges from the lips of those that were raised at the place of blessing, oh my God, I want to tell you something. These young men were products of the prophets. And the products of the prophets could not recognize a move of God when it was coming their way. They saw Elisha and they made fun of his bald head. Can I tell you something? You're likely to see a lot of stuff when the Spirit of God starts to move. But don't mock it. You need to praise God for it. God forbid when the miracle steps through the door that we're unable to recognize that this is a move of God that we're in the midst of. Oh, let me say this. We will not be able to escape the privilege that God has blessed us with by filling us with the Holy Ghost. You can try to run, but if you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, you cannot get away from the hand of the Almighty as it begins to work and deal with you in your life. You've been backstopped by a prophecy. You've been backstopped by a blessing. You've been backstopped by a divine vision and destiny that God has for your life. Come on, nothing's going to get by you now. Don't let it get past you. Elisha, when he was called, sacrificed his possessions. Some people want their soul to be saved, but they want to keep their stuff behind. You don't want unsanctified stuff. Bring yourself to God and bring all that you have and all that you are to the Lord. He sacrificed his oxen right there on the spot. I remember when I first came here and I started working a job, I got a phone call from Brother Huntley. He said, I hear you've been working a secular job. I said, yes, sir, got to take care of my family. He said, someone that's been preaching full time as long as you should be de dedicating your time to the kingdom of God. How much money do you need a month to make it? I thought, huh? He said, I'll help raise some money. I'll get some brethren to help you. And he put together 10 men that helped me for a year so that I could say goodbye to the secular work and hello to the work of God. Yeah. Now, I know that's not the story for everybody, but in my case, he gave me a word. And I received that word. And in the strength of that word, I went forward and God took care of it. I want to tell you, you're back.
Not by a word. If the word of angels is steadfast, then the word of, a of prophecy is steadfast. You are going to receive. You are going to be blessed. You are going to be healed. Your children will serve the Lord. Oh, Elisha teaches us that don't let your ordinariness preclude a miraculous future. Elisha was so much different than Elijah. His hair was different. I envision Elijah looking something like Jimi Hendrix. But Elisha was a bullheaded man. Elijah jumps on the stage of sacred history out of the blue. Elisha comes gradually. He comes from the farm to the family to the sacrifice. Then he serves the prophet. And then he moves into the dimension of the mantle. Step by step by step. Elijah is solitary. Elisha has a family life and wants to bid farewell to his family. What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say this. So many times we preclude our future based on the fact that we're just ordinary. Did you know ordinary is special when God has designed you to be exactly who you are? Did you know you don't have to be like me or him or her or this one or that one to be blessed of the Lord? You just need to receive. My God. I feel like the Holy Ghost is going to quicken to somebody something that's been spoken to you maybe even years ago that you've already relegated to the past and you've kind of said, that's passed me by. I'm here to tell you, it was backstopped. It didn't get away from you. And God wants to bring it back to your memory. And the thing that he said he was going to do then, he's going to do now. He's going to do it now. Ooh. Don't, you're not going to bypass the prophetic in my life. I want us to stand. As human beings, sometimes we let people come and go into our lives. Sometimes people that we care very much about. For one reason or another, we lose touch and we drift apart and we forget about each other. But you never really can forget. Peter deliberately tried to put Jesus and this whole experiment of discipleship, Christianity, and all of that, messiahship, behind him. He cursed, he swore, and said, I know not the man. And he ran from that fire that day, probably prepared to reimmerse himself in fishermen, the work of fishing and net mending. But the problem, Peter, you can leave the fire. You can leave the cross. You can even walk away from the dying Jesus on Calvary. But you can't escape the prophecy. What's the prophecy? Matthew 16. Whom do men say that I am? Some say you're John. Some say you're Elijah. Who do you say that I am? Oh, thou art the Christ. Son of the living God. Thou art Peter. Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I give unto you the keys of the king. Oh my God. Peter tried to run from the, he ran, he got away from the fire. He got away from the crucifixion scene. He got away from Jesus, but he never could get away from the prophecy. 
Come on, the prophets, right? The, they'll escape this one, they'll escape that one. But Elisha's the backstop. The word, amen, that God has declared that is going to be your future is always going to be there, Peter. You can run, but you cannot hide. I told you, you would have the keys to the kingdom and preside over the opening of the doors to the Gentile world, and I'll meet you in the upper room, buddy. Praise God. Come on, somebody. Somebody has forgotten what God has said. You need to be reminded today that what God said, he meant it. And it isn't time or circumstance or age or difficulties or sickness or loneliness. None of those things matter. God. I remember when Brother McFarland came into our church some few years ago and he began to prophesy how that this church is going to have a special move of God. How that there would be souls. That wasn't the first one through the years. Here, there, here, there, along the way. And so I'm reminded today, this church has a future. Not because of me. Not because of the music. Not because of my lovely wife or any of the leaders here, but because we have a sure word of prophecy. Can't get past that. Whew. If you want to, if you feel like God has a future and you know in your heart God has a future, I want you just to stand right here. We're going to close in a group prayer together. We've already prayed. But let's pray one more time because I really feel this. And I want you to see Elisha as not just the prophet, but prophecy. History won't escape prophecy. The United States of America won't escape prophecy. The church won't escape the prophecy. What is the, what is the prophecy? Oh, that he's going to have a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That there will be how many? Well, it says myriads upon myriads. Innumerable multitudes of people are already there. How are they already there? Prophetically, they're there. What does that tell me? God is going to have a church. I want you to lift your hands right now. If you can think of something that's been spoken over you, that moved you, and that maybe you forgot, or maybe you've doubted right now, reactivate the prophecy. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, Lamb of God. When I was 18 years old, somebody told me, and he was a man who walked with the Spirit, he said, Brother Alicio, I saw you standing before thousands and preaching to a massive auditorium full of people. I received that. Been a lot of years, been a lot of coming and going, but I hold on to that. What are you holding on to? In the name of Jesus.